this episode of the Your Health is Important Facebook Live broadcast. We are live in the studios of Ageless MD for your health. And we're here to answer your healthcare questions. So you know how we do it. We're going to start off. I'm going to give you some brief updates on a few topics that are going on in healthcare right now. And then it's the people's show. So remember, you tell us who you are, where you are logging in from, and we'll answer your questions. It's been great to be here, uh, as always. This is our, our second show of the year, and I'm telling you, it has been a wonderful year so far. I hope that everybody is participating in Dr. Kaya's Weight Loss Challenge. And let me tell you, it is definitely a challenge. Uh, you want to do those things that we do when we do what we do. Uh, most people did manage to gain weight over the holidays. One, uh, and I tell people, don't apologize for it. It just kind of happened. And the reason why is because, you know, we've been locked up for two years with COVID. And now we're finally out. We're able to socialize with friends and family. And what do we do when we socialize? We eat, we drink, we do things that are going to put some inches on us and make us gain a few pounds. So that is not uh, unusual behavior. It is, uh, again, let's celebrate that that was it. But now it's time to get right. Dr. Kaya's Weight Loss Challenge 2023, we want you to log on. You go to the website, lipodrops.com, lipodrops.com. Get on the pinpoint plan, and we're going to gift you with so many various different things that you will that will become available for you. You register for free, and you're going to be basically just following your weight loss journey as am I. Now, I hate, Dr. Kaya hates to tell you, uh, again, the last couple of weeks have been uh, busy. We've been stressed, uh, eating, working, et cetera. I stepped on the scale. I saw that I had gained three pounds. I couldn't believe it. And so uh, I, you know, basically spending this week uh, exhausting those three pounds. I tell patients all the time, I say, if you gain some weight, don't wait until you put on 10 pounds or 15 pounds. As soon as you see the weight has started to creep up, that's the time to take charge before it, quote, sticks to you and becomes real weight. Right now, it will be, uh, you know, much less difficult. I won't say easy. I say much less difficult to lose the weight because I became aware of it and then we're doing it. So we're going there from there. Now, um, what's going on in the world right now? Uh, the seven day average of hospital patients testing positive for COVID has declined. That seven day average is now 30,000 uh, as a per day versus 47,000 that peaked around January the 10th. So now we're about two weeks later. And we're seeing that the numbers are dropping and decreasing. Only 5% of hospital beds occupied are due to COVID versus 21% this exact time last year. So it's possible that decline may even be greater. I think more people without question are testing positive. I'm literally seeing people testing positive every day in my office or they're calling me. I took a home test. I'm positive. So uh, the, the numbers, of course, they, they just can't count the numbers of people that are testing positive because people aren't reporting them. When people call me and tell me it goes on their medical record, but I'm not reporting that data to an official body that's doing the counting. So the numbers are definitely being undercounted. But the thing is that because of the Omicron variant, the Omicron variant was vicious, ruthless. Everybody got it about a year ago, uh, right after the Christmas holidays. So January 2022, between Christmas and January 2022, that's when so many people caught the Omicron variant. And so now people have natural immunity. So the herd immunity phenomena is allowing people with the newest variant to have much milder disease, stay out of the hospital and definitely decrease the death rate. So that's one of the good things about having had so many people exposed. So it's been almost a full three years going nonstop surges, peaks. Uh, you know, we having another rise in the pandemic. So we are we are full uh, on uh, learning how to deal with this virus. And it's going to be something that we're probably going to have to deal with for the rest of our lives. Now, the FDA is making a new recommendation. Now, this is the FDA, not the CDC. So the Food and Drug Administration is recommending that one, we stop chasing vaccine and variants. So one, because people are getting shot fatigue. Most people, or not most people, but a lot of people have had five shots. So they had the two original COVID vaccines, they had the two boosters, and then they had the new bivalent booster, a total of five shots. And so uh, they have become shot fatigued and just aren't interested in getting more shots. So the recommendation currently is being made by the FDA is that we have one shot annually we try to pick out which variant is the most important and you get a, a one annual COVID shot just as you get an annual flu shot 
and that that's how we're going to deal with this phenomenon moving forward in the future. So unless something changes, that's going to be the way that we're going to do this. And so I think that you can you can expect it, anticipate it, look forward to it. But it does amaze me uh, that when I talk to patients in my office, uh, even today, I ask people, have you had uh, the COVID vaccine? Yes. Have you had the flu shot? No, I don't ever take the flu shot. So a lot of individuals don't take the flu shot, whereas we're in the flu pandemic right now, and more people die from the flu than from any other infectious disease. So, and and the, the flu shot has been around forever. It's proven. Everybody knows about it. Yet uh, there are people that, quote, you state that unemphatically, the exact same language, quote, I never take the flu shot. Uh, and so I recommend that you do. There's nothing disease causing in the flu shot. So uh, it only gives you protection. Now, so this is the pecking order of things. If you go to get the flu shot, they're going to offer you the COVID booster at the same time. If you had had COVID once or twice or multiple times, like some people, if you've had at least two shots uh, of the COVID vaccine, get the flu shot first, then wait two weeks and then get the new COVID bivalent booster that will optimize your immune system and give you the best defense that you have. Other than what Dr. Kari has been telling you for three years, vitamin D at 5,000 international units per day and our newest product, the lipoimmune, the lipoimmune, which has uh, elderberry extract, zinc, and vitamin C. Those three things plus vitamin D optimize your immune system function and allow you to have your best opportunity to not only treat disease, but to prevent disease so that your body remains healthy. Okay, Havoc, let's do it. Let's roll. Let's let's find out who's who's tuned in right now. Let's start doing what we do. Okay, Janae Allen from West Palm Beach, Florida. Hi, Janae. Thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate you. Charlotte Brown, where you from, Charlotte? Didn't get to put that in there. Sean Big Time Green, my man. Good evening and welcome, Sean, as a regular. For those who haven't seen it, recognize Sean Big Time Green. Mar Maurice Williams. Hi, Maurice. How are you? Thank you for joining us this evening. Rachel Harrison from New Orleans checking in. We have New Orleans. We have Baton Rouge. Miss McKeever Bowling, thank you so much here in Douglasville. Uh, Dorcas Brown from Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, we got Midwest now. Michigan, Midwest. Okay, Carolyn Brown, thank you so much. C.L. Turner from Baton Rouge. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you know how to cook. Ruth Spence from Baltimore, Maryland. Now, okay, now we on the East Coast. Baltimore, Orlando, Florida. East Coast on the South Side. Candace Powell, thank you so much. Kathy London, good evening, Kathy. Thank you so much for tuning in. Yannette Franklin, good evening. Thank you as well. We know you have choices. Deidre Hightower from Houston, Texas. Okay, now we got the West proper. Maurice again from Chicago, Chi-Town, California. Chantrell Other Sullivan, thank you so much. B. Dukes from Northern Virginia, Virginia Beach area. Okay, good. Thank you, Denise. Marvin Faison from Pennsylvania. Marvin, thank you so much for tuning in. Marla Smith from Florida. Thank you, Marla. We appreciate you. Glaster Ormsby from Fort Lauderdale, no, from Lauderdale Lakes, Florida. Lauderdale Lakes, Florida. Okay. Mary Hollinsworth. What if I took a flu shot? That's the first question. We'll go with that. Sherry Jackson, hi from Louisiana. We are good. Okay. Lorraine Daniels, hello from Maryland. Hi, Lorraine. Thank you so much. Okay. Kathy London, Kathy from New York City. Thank you, Kathy. We have Kathy with a C. Diane Dumas from Dallas, Texas. Hi, Diane. Thank you so much for tuning in. Travis Thornton from Columbus, Georgia. Okay, Columbus, Georgia, local, more welcome. Okay, so now we're going to roll and get to your healthcare questions, and we're going to do a roll call again a little later. Remember, uh, and, and if you're first time, this is your first time tuning in to Ask Dr. MJ's Facebook Live, then don't hesitate to let us know that. It's a first time tuning in, and my question is, well, that's what we want to know. Uh, who's first time is we have some, some uh, seasoned, seasoned participants uh, Sean, big time here, I think has been with us from day one. And I'm so glad to see an African-American male that's getting and capturing this healthcare information and hopefully sharing it with his friends. I tell people, whenever you are in a situation or a circumstance that people are gathered, talk health, share healthcare information. When you're with your family, y'all getting together on the weekend to have dinner or the movies or family reunions, talk about your family's health. What, what type of disease state did grandmama have? What did granddaddy die from? Was it cancer? Was it a heart attack? Was it a stroke? It wasn't old age. As I hear that. People say, oh, they just died from old age. Not when you're 62. Not when you're 68. Even if you're 90-something, you may have an old age, but you had some disease states that your family members need to be aware of so they can help uh, be screened for these diseases. And if, you know, you look like 
if you got one of those families where everybody looks alike, then you have the same gene pool. Everybody has they're from the same building blocks. They are susceptible to the same disease states. And we want to make sure that that is indeed where we are and we're protecting ourselves. OK, first question, Abbott, let's do it. What's good for hot flashes with insomnia at night? Dorcas Brown, hot flashes. Okay. Ideally, so there are some natural things you can you can get. You can go to a place like the vitamin shop or GNC, and they can give you some, just tell them what your symptoms are. There are plant-based, what are called phytoestrogens that can relieve those symptoms. Those are all from low estrogen and, uh, you know, the hot flashes, the sweats, the insomnia, all of those things. But ideally, Ideally, you would benefit greatly from bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, BHRT. BHRT is a state of the art to treat this clinically. Dr. Collier performs BHRT in his office. Uh, I have patients that fly from around the country to get this. And what this is, this is a customized treatment plan that optimizes your neurohormonal status. It makes you the best you that you can bleed. We analyze what your your deficits are as far as your hormones are concerned replace and or treat with uh you know replacement hormones it literally puts you back to where you were when you're in your 20s and 30s it is the fountain of youth and immediate relief of those symptoms that is long lasting and sustaining for women on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy it increases your libido makes it go through the roof so you have desire to have sex it makes your vagina thick. It makes your vagina moist. It makes your vagina receptive for intercourse. Takes away high flashes, insomnia, increases your muscle mass, decreases your body fat, improves things like sleep, anxiety, depression, makes you the pleasant, sweet person that you were before you start going through menopause or perimenopausal. And so the objective is to keep you that way soft and sweet. So bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, BHRT, we perform that service at Agents of Atlanta here at my office, but you can Google it and say bioidentical hormone replacement therapy in my area and see if you can find a provider that does that. Great question, Dorcas. <clears throat> Arnita Norris Grace. This is Arnita from Mississippi. Do you need to take magnesium with your when your hormones are off balance? What do they help? Magnesium is absolutely incredible. Magnesium is a mineral. And so it is. It, you need to take it regardless of whether the hormones are off balance or not. It's one of those supplements that I, I recommend that people take because most people are magnesium deficient. It helps with everything from your digestion to several biochemical processes that your body uh, needs magnesium for to uh, complete successfully. So magnesium uh, is available in a variety of different sources. Uh, it can be combined with uh, with other um, uh compounds as well, but you can just get magnesium by itself and do so. Uh, food sources would include, uh, of course, as always, your 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 fish, your seafood, uh, high magnesium, and uh, particularly your uh, fishy fish like salmon, etc. Very good in magnesium, but it is hard to eat enough of the right foods to give your body what it needs. One, because the foods just don't have the same nutritional value, so you'd have to eat so much that the caloric intake will make you gain weight versus the benefit that you get from getting your magnesium and your vitamin D and your vitamin C and all the things that you need to be getting from foods. So that is why supplements are so important. Now, so uh, you can go to the website, lipodrops.com, Dr. Collier's Trio. Dr. Collier's Trio, the things, three things that I take every day and I recommend that you do as well. Probiotics, God's gift to your health. Helps with everything from digestion, takes away that bubble gut, stops that, that bloating that you get in your abdomen, uh, helps you have good bowel function and good food digestion and helps with food allergies, helps with other allergies as well. Everything from asthma to eczema benefit from a course of probiotics. Probiotics are nothing but good bacteria that replace the bad bacteria that be can become prevalent in your gut. When that happens, you have foul stools, you have bad breath, your skin, when you perspire, uh, you, you don't smell good. Uh, you know, uh, I think the local term would be funky. So uh, under those circumstances, you take probiotics, all of that improves tremendously. Your bowel movements are so fragrant. They don't smell good, but they don't smell bad. And you'll you'll be able to appreciate just the change in your GI health from adding probiotics to one of your supplements. Vitamin D at 5,000 international units per day. The normal range for your vitamin D level is 30 to 90. Most of the people that I see that are not taking vitamin D are under 10. 
When your vitamin D is under 10, you have weak bones. You're susceptible to fractures under the slightest provocation. You slip, you fall, you extend your wrist to catch it, you break your arm or you break your shoulder. Uh, your teeth become loose. Your teeth become soft. You bite down on something crunchy or a piece of ice or something, anything. Your tooth breaks and now you got to get the you know emergency dental treatment. Uh, so soft bones, soft teeth and poor gum, you know, gum disease when you have low vitamin D. Uh, when your vitamin D, again, the normal range being 30 to 90, when your vitamin D is 40 or higher, it boosts and optimizes your immune system function. It makes your body an unfavorable environment for various infectious pathogens. So viruses, bacteria, fungi cannot live in your body when your vitamin D level is 40 or higher. It's just an unfavorable environment. So if you got sick, you wouldn't stay sick long. It can't live in your body for extended periods of time. The disease state will be milder. That's provided you get sick. Chances are you're probably not going to get sick at all. But if you did, you have much milder disease states than somebody with a low vitamin D. Guess what? You get that vitamin D up to 60. Bam. All of a sudden now you have cancer protection. Multiple Multiple studies have shown protection from various types of cancers, including pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer for women, prostate cancer for men. Uh, a simple, elegant thing is not even medicine. It's just a vitamin, vitamin D at a dose of 5,000 international units per day to boost your immune system and give you cancer protection. So we had the probiotics. We got the vitamin D. Thirdly, my third daily dose recommendation, omega-3 fish oil. Omega-3 fish oil is good. Uh, it's cardiovascular protective, but helps prevent heart attacks and strokes, decreases inflammation in your body. Virtually every disease state has an inflammatory component. Diabetes is an inflammatory disease state. High blood pressure is an inflammatory disease state. High cholesterol is an inflammatory disease state. Most of the side effects and problems that cause you to have organ deterioration, decreased kidney function, heart attacks and strokes, all are caused by inflammation. You use an anti-inflammatory, vitamin D is the body's natural anti-inflammatory, along with omega-3 fish oil, you decrease the amount of inflammation in your body and you are much healthier, much less susceptible to inflammatory disease processes. Okay, great question. Next question, Habit. I bought the Keto Max pack with taking, doing the keto diet and doing Manjaro make my glucose levels drop too low. Uh, the keto pack does not affect your glucose levels. Uh, so uh, taking the Manjaro should not also. Manjaro and the medications like it, that's the injectable uh, medication that's currently indicated for patients with diabetes, but they are seeking a weight loss indication strictly for Manjaro. Uh, the other drugs on the market for that are Ozempic, O O O. Ozempic, which has only a diabetes education, but results in dramatic weight loss. And Wegovy, which is Ozempic renamed uh, and given a weight loss indication. So Ozempic and Wegovy are the exact same medication manufactured by the same company. They just relabel it. They call it Wegovy for weight loss, which has an indication for losing weight and Ozempic which has an indication for diabetes, but makes you lose weight. So everybody who's into weight loss knows these are the hottest products available right now for weight loss. They are literally the equivalent of getting a gastric bypass. You can lose up to 30 pounds of every 100 pounds that you are overweight. People are doing this on these medications. And basically, they just alter your body's ability to, to eat. You just don't want to eat. You eat less. Uh, it slows gastric emptying. So you have a sense of satiety. You feel full. And so that's how that works. But when you have a normal blood sugar, guess what? It doesn't lower your blood sugar. It just hypoglycemia or low blood sugar is not a real side effect of that medication unless you're taking other anti-diabetes medications. That can be something as simple as metformin. That can be insulin. That can be uh, some of the other medications called sulfurureas, uh, medications that are secretagogues that make your body increase insulin, which makes your, your insulin, your sugar levels go down. So, uh, but as an as a individual component, Highly unusual that that happens, that you get uh, low blood sugar from it. But you also have to make sure that you do have some fuel. Remember, it makes you not want to eat. So you got to eat something so you have some, some sugar. I highly recommend when doing those injections uh, because of the increased acid production in your stomach and the sometimes queasy feeling that you can get. I have found that yogurt and the probiotic tablets 
is a great combination to help relieve that side effect or adverse event, if you will. And you do so much better on those products. So a cup of yogurt, Greek style, any any flavor you like once or twice a day and or probiotics, uh, which is it gives you the good bacteria, but it gives you something on your stomach. The yogurt kind of coats your stomach. But if you cannot tolerate yogurt, don't like yogurt or whatever, just take the probiotics, but put something on your stomach. That's simple and easy to digest. I like applesauce. I like things uh, uh, like peanut butter. All those are very good things that can help you uh, ease the amount of acid in your stomach, give you a sense of satiety, and help you lose the weight. Great question. Betty Dodson, I have vasculitis, been on Actrema and prednisone for years. Is there anything natural I can do to get there over this? By the way, I'm 75 and put on these 50 pounds since this started. Okay, itis, vasculitis means inflammation of appendicitis same thing osteoarthritis same thing inflammation of vasculitis is inflammation of the blood vessels uh usually the smaller arteries sometimes veins uh that are in the low extremities it can be all over but uh usually the most common places in the lower extremities because the further away you get from the heart the more difficult it is to provide nutrition to those arteries and veins so vasculitis is inflammation of that vasculature the chronic inflammation can irritate blood cells causing clots Clots then causing the sequelae of clots, which is heart attacks and strokes. So how do you treat inflammation? The most common thing is prednisone, steroid, anti-inflammatory. But the natural things that I just spoke about, the vitamin D, the omega-3 fish oil, good natural ways that can help decrease that inflammation. I have found that adding probiotics helps with so many of these quote unquote autoimmune diseases. Uh, and that would be things like lupus and um, and um uh, I'm trying to think of some of the others, but uh, lupus is the main one. Uh, that's an autoimmune disease where your body does not recognize does not recognize itself as self and start to attack it as if it was a foreign body or a kidney transplant that didn't match or, or blood transfusion that was the wrong type of blood. Those types of things. So autoimmune various autoimmune diseases will respond to anti-inflammatory therapy. And again, so I place all of my patients on uh, um, vitamin D. And omega-3 fish oil to help with those things and decrease inflammation. And you stay on them. You don't just take them uh, until you're feeling better. You stay on them and keep your body in its lowest inflammatory state and condition. So good luck, Betty. Get you some vitamin D. Get you some omega-3 fish oil and see if that helps. Don't expect one pill to do it. But uh, you have to, you've been on it for, for a couple of weeks and then you stay on it and it's going to improve that condition. Ruth Spence, I've had a cough now going on two years. Is there anything I can take for it? Don't know if it's food related or not. People that work look at me like I'm crazy. They all think you're spreading the COVID, Ruth. So one of the most common things that give people a chronic cough like that is a very, it's the number one blood pressure medication in the world called lisinopril and drugs like it. Those drugs are called ACE inhibitors, uh, angiotensin uh, uh, receptor blockers. And what they do is in the lungs, they cause a mild inflammatory condition that makes you cough. The cough is dry. You don't produce anything, but it's a, a chronic and continuing hacking cough. So if you're taking uh, a blood pressure medication that could be causing that, lisinopril is the most common, but not the only one. Uh, the class of drugs called ACE inhibitors or angiotensin, angiotensin receptor blockers, ARBs and ACEs, ACEs and ARBs can cause them. Chronic lung inflammation of, of any type. I would give you a course of antibiotics, of course. The most common one and the most effective is an antibiotic called azithromycin, commonly referred to as the Z-Pack, azithromycin, the Z-Pack. That antibiotic has a unique anti-inflammatory capability, particularly in the lungs, which is why I treat all my COVID patients with azithromycin. Remember, COVID is a virus. Antibiotics do nothing for viruses, but it does help treat the inflammation that's caused by a viral infection and also can help prevent the post-viral bacteria pneumonia that causes a lot of problems in people that have had COVID infections. They get the COVID get over the COVID infection, but they get a secondary uh, bronchitis slash pneumonia that can ultimately result in death. Uh, so it's important that you proactively treat that. I don't wait until a person is sick. Uh, as soon as they're diagnosed, that's part of the treatment regimen that I utilize to treat my patients and we get great outcomes, great outcomes. Okay, great question. <clears throat> Joyce Bethel, what's the cause of eye twitching? Okay, that Joyce, that is such a great question because everybody's 
you got that twitch people think you're winking at them all the men that know you they say oh joyce joyce give me that eye she's winking at me that twitching of the eyes is a, a, a neurological pathway that can be established between the muscles the periorbital muscle groups and the brain and once that pathway is solidified it's very difficult to block it there are medications that can do it uh, uh neurontin uh, is one that helps deal with neuropathic issues but again oftentimes the problem is in Inflammation, and so you treat it with an anti-inflammatory, the body's natural anti-inflammatory, vitamin D and omega-3 fish oil. Uh, again, things I would try uh, in this situation. Sometimes you literally have to ablate the nerve. That means uh, burning it uh, with electric with cautery or a chemical burn or something to block that pathway so the eye is not being stimulated. The problem with that uh, approach is it's overwhelming sometimes and it may stop you from twitching, but it may also stop you from being able to blink your eyes and blinking your eyes is very important so that you coat your eyes with tears and your eyes don't dry out. And, um, you know, there's a part of the natural eye physiology. OK, great question. OK, Nora Martin says, I can't have a bowel movement unless I take center. Should I be worried? Uh, yes, but there are probably some other things you can do. Senna is a good uh, a mild stimulant, but what you need to do is, one, clean out your colon. Uh, so I would do that by taking a, a mega laxative like magnesium citrate or milk of magnesia or something to that effect. Uh, there are several things. You have, uh, Miralax, when you take Miralax uh, in high doses, it is a very effective laxative. They use Miralax to, to perform colon cleansing before a person has a colonoscopy. So those things, once your colon is empty, then you keep your colon moving. Your colon muscles, your, your colon is nothing but a tube of muscles. And if they get stretched out from constantly retaining stool, they don't function as effectively and as efficiently to move your bowel forward. Your, your colon is like an upside down U. On the right side of your body, it comes up from, from the groin area up to about your belly button. That's called the ascending colon turns 90 degrees comes right across at the belly button level that's called the transverse colon and then goes down on the left side of your body that's called the descending colon you have the descending colon then the sigmoid colon then the rectum all of that can be utilized to store stool ideally when your body is working the way that it's supposed to the right side of your colon has liquid stool in it that's coming straight out of your small intestines as it the, the function of the, the large intestine is two things one to, to reabsorb fluid, two, to store and hold the stool. So the liquid stool is on the right side, the fluid is reabsorbed, and by the time it gets to the transverse colon, it's soft and squishy. More fluid is, is, is taken from it, and by the time it gets to the descending colon, now you have a solid stool that you can push against, and that's when you sit on the toilet and have and, and do what's called a bowel salve and go, mm. that helps push it out and gravity helps push it out because now the colon is pointing down. The problem is, one, women don't like to go to the bathroom outside of their own home. So they'll get the urge to have a bowel movement and will hold it. And the longer you hold it, the longer the colon, which never stops doing what it's doing, which is the reabsorption of fluid. So now what should be semi-solid stool in the transverse colon can become solid stool. That solid stool has to move over to the from right to left, turn 90 degrees in that colon. And when that happens, that can be an unpleasant, crampy experience. But if it if if you retain it so long that you start getting solid stool on the ascending side, on the right side, then that's really uncomfortable and unpleasant because that has to move up against gravity, has to squeeze very hard to get it up. And most of the time it won't do that. It just sits there. And so liquid stool starts to run around it. So you have the symptom of alternating diarrhea and constipation when the problem is really just constipation. So you clean the colon out. Then you 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 protect the colon by uh, taking something like Miralax or Fibrocon or some fiber product. You change the the uh, the bacteria in your colon to one that's positive by taking probiotics. You can take our product. We have a, a product called Colon Cleanse or, or Lipo Cleanse rather. This is not a laxative, but what it does do it, it makes you have large, easy to pass stool. It slows down the reabsorption of the fluid, so your stools don't get dry and hard. They stay moist enough to continue to move forward. Make sure that you drink enough water so that your stools don't get too dry and hard. And when you get the urge to go and have a bowel movement, you have to go and have a bowel movement. You cannot wait till you're in the comfort of your own home and bathroom. Uh, you may want to carry Clorox wipes. You may want to carry air freshener, whatever you need to do so that you can have that experience and, and empty your colon on a regular basis. And establish a normal bowel habit. Most people have a time of day. 
Uh, for some people, it's in the morning. They get up, they wash the face, brush the teeth, drink a cup of coffee, have a good bowel movement. It may be in the evening. Again, uh, coffee is a great stimulant for a lot of people. It's not the coffee per se. It's what's called a warm liquid response. You put warm liquid in your gut, it stimulates the gut and makes you want to have a bowel movement. It could be coffee. It could be tea. It could be just warm water with lemon or just warm water. Some people just want to put some taste in it. They put lemon or lime in it. But just the warm liquid in your gut stimulates you to have a bowel movement. So this is something that requires constant attention and you got to retrain your colon to work uh, in the normal manner. So great question. I'm glad a lot of people needed that information. I'm glad that's why I took the time to explain it so thoroughly. Mike Thompson, Jr. First off, I'm a fan. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate you. I join you on the Ricky Smiley Morning Show, the Ricky Smiley Morning Show, where we do our Wellness Wednesday segment. It airs at 820 Eastern Standard Time each and every Wednesday. Tune in, please. And they replay it on various stations across the country. You just ask your device, play Ricky Smiley Morning Show, and it'll go to it basically any time of day. And uh, and then on the website, the RSMS uh, website, uh, they have uh, a segment with Dr. Collier. And then you can go to YouTube where a lot of them are reposted. You can get a lot of good health information there. So all of this is under Ask ASK, Dr. MJ. You can go to the YouTube channel and find out. And again, we're going to make it and have it made an announcement to me earlier. We're going to tie in a link to the website so that when you go to the website, you can come to this show for the Facebook Live. You can go to the website and look at videos. You'll be able to capture all of that healthcare information when doing so. Do I have anything to help promote a healthy prostate? Uh, yes. Uh, again, our uh, Dr. Kaya's trio, the probiotics are very good. The uh, lipo cleanse, which helps keep your clothes clean. And then, um, again, the number one thing you can do to have a healthy prostate, and people have heard Dr. Kaya say this, is frequent ejaculation. That means you need to have the sexual experience a minimum, a minimum of two times per week. And that's not two times on Monday and none for the rest of the week. You need to try to spread it out. But that is the absolute minimum. Hear me, men. Hear me, men. You need to have a sexual experience, uh, preferably every other day or daily. You cannot have it too much. Two times a day is not too much. Three times a day is not too much to maintain good prostate health. Let me explain. The prostate is basically like a sponge, its function of which is to make prostatic fluid. The prostatic fluid is what your sperm cells swim in. Your testicles uh, make sperm cells. The prostate makes prostatic fluid for the sperm cells to swim in. When you ejaculate, it contains sperms and prostatic fluid. That's the combination. Now, the purpose of the prostatic fluid, one, to provide a, a positive environment for sperm cells to live in and protect the sperm cells from the angry environment of a woman's vagina. A woman's vagina attacks men's sperm cells. They consider them foreign bodies. Uh, they attack it as if it was an invading pathogen, which it is. However, once the sperm has left the vagina and entered the uterus, which is where it has to go for fertilization to occur, the uterus is a friendly environment to sperm cells. So the prostatic fluid had to protect the sperm cells until they get to the uterus. Once they're at the uterus, they're good to go. Well, that prostatic fluid is manufactured 24-7 by the prostate. The, the issue is if you don't continue to, to remove it, then it sits there and becomes stagnant. It sits in your body at 98.6 degrees, ideally, perfectly warm temperature for bacterial growth. And bacteria that is in everybody's GI tract and GU tract, that's your genital urethral tract, uh, will start to grow. And once that bacteria starts to grow, you have infection. So you can get infection, which causes inflammation of the prostate, creates a condition called benign prostatic hypertrophy, where your prostate starts to swell. That swelling, swollen, inflamed prostate on the chronic and constant inflammation now is susceptible to cancer. So you end up with prostate cancer. So the best thing you can do to help promote a healthy prostate, again, we have a product called Lipo-T. You're going to see it on the website very soon. Uh, the Lipo-T product is very good. It enhances men's health. But again, the number one thing you can do, frequent ejaculation, men. So talk to your partners, let them know. Say, Dr. Kanye, say, I need my medicine. <laughs> and you do. So you get your medicine and you'll be healthy. And she'll be glad that you did. Thank you. All right. Good question, Mike. Uh, to that Odapi, to that Odapi, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. 
I have diabetes and stage four kidney failure. My legs are always swelling. I don't know why. Well, your legs are swelling because you have stage four kidney failure and your body is not uh, removing fluid the way that it should. It's retaining fluid. So uh, one, you if you still have some urinary output, then you, you can be salvaged. You have to maintain a low sodium diet 24 seven. You have to monitor them and you got to have just enough fluids to give your body what it needs, but not overwhelm your body with fluids. So this is one case where I'm saying you don't drink as much water or liquids and water being the number one liquid, uh, but you don't need to challenge your kidneys with, you know, a lot of other things uh, like definitely not sodas and definitely not, uh, you know, sugary drinks and things like that. Uh, you have to be concerned about alcohol intake. Uh, any liquid that you take in is a liquid that your kidneys are not removing. And so your body retains it. Gravity takes it to your legs. And so your legs swell. And so hopefully um, at the end, of the, you know, you lay down and when you wake up in the morning, your legs have, have reduced somewhat. They may not be skinny again, but they should reduce if you have any kidney function. If you don't have uh, uh, any uh, substance kidney function, not making a lot of urine, then uh, ultimately you're going to have to have a kidney transplant or go on dialysis. You go on dialysis, it removes that excess fluid. So the, the problem is it can dry you out so much that you feel like a razor. And so you don't want to be that dry. And hopefully you got enough kidney function that you can salvage of what you're doing. So now you have a diabetic nephropathy or kidney disease caused by diabetes. The other thing you can do is make sure that your diabetes is well controlled. A diabetic that's uncontrolled is continuing to do chronic damage to the kidneys uh, and, ever, you know, due to the small vascular tool where filtering occurs in the kidney, you get damaged because of basically the sugar crystals floating around in your blood. But it's doing the same thing to your eyes. It's doing the same thing to your brain. It's doing the same thing to your heart. So you have a, a, a chronic inflammatory disease state that is aggravating the vascular tool on a cellular level and causing damage to your kidneys. So you got to work very well with your primary care doctor, your internist, and your nephrologist, your kidney specialist, to optimize your, 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 your kidney function. And when they tell you two gram low sodium, they mean two gram low sodium diet. And then the amount of liquids, I mean, it's almost like you have to measure what you're drinking and taking in and, uh, you know, and count everything. Again, not just water, but anything else that's liquid that you take in you got to be very careful and conscientious about okay so good luck with that make sure that you're working with your healthcare providers and this is going to require a great partnership to get a good outcome but you can do it and the fact that you're asking the question means that you can be helped okay mad man here man i love that man man i have palpitations i've been to the cardiologist and the echo stress test and the heart monitor it all came back negative what can i do to stop this problem uh one palpitations are not necessarily a problem that's your heart resetting its electrical phenomena if it was a pathological palpitation they would offer you electrical stimulation uh there are things they can do to literally ablate the nerves there's an off on switch in your heart called the ab node that tells your heart to pump it's like a light switch going up and down off and on off and on they can actually go in uh and and cut that wire so to speak so that your heart doesn't get that and it results back to a basic heart rate which is somewhere between 50 and 60 beats per minute uh the problem is you can not then respond to when your heart needs to be faster like when you have exercise or when you have the need to have a um, heart being pumped harder and more frequent with much enthusiasm so that may require a pacemaker to do that so it may take over a, a couple of things to do it there are ways to do it but if they have not offered you those things that means you you don't have a pathological palpitation you just have palpitations and if it does not result in a cardiac arrhythmia and if when you had the echo they told you your ejection fraction which is how efficiently your heart is pumping is adequate then it's just a matter of not worrying about it, uh, you know, not thinking about it. Most of us have palpitations. We just don't know it. Our brain blocks it out. And only when your heart rhythm changes that you may become conscientiously aware of it. And then I remember before I understood this, I'd be ready with my hands, ready for self-imposed CPR in case my heart stopped pumping. But that's not, uh, you know, necessarily a bad thing. Palpitations are abnormal but they are not necessarily pathological. So if they have not offered you those things, then chances are you do not have the cardiac arrhythmia, your echo, your ejection fraction is good, and it's just a, a, a matter of dealing with it. Now, when you lay down at night, when your brain is not otherwise occupied, you may become more acutely aware 
of your heart pal palpating. And that, of course, once you're aware of it, you can't stop thinking about it, which makes you chronically sleep deprived. You become chronically sleep deprived. Your stress level goes up. You have more palpitations. It can be a vicious cycle. So there are medications that can help as well. Uh, beta blocker class drugs, uh, the most common is called metoprolol. There are two others, one called bistolic and one called carbetalol or Coreg. Uh, Coreg works wonderfully, but you have to take it twice a day. All the others can be taken once a day uh, to beta block your heart. That controls your heart's rhythm so they can only beat at a certain pace. And uh, that is one of the good things about that, too. So uh, continue to work with your cardiologist. There is a solution for this problem. Again, it may be uh, pharmacological. It may be do nothing and just observe and see if it becomes a real problem or it may be, uh, uh, you know, interventional, which means they go in and burn those nerves to, to stimulate your heart to, to have those abnormal beats. So that is that man, man, that might be the best question we've had on this segment. Um, um, definitely this year i'm not sure whether i would say all year but that's a great question and please stay in contact let us know how you're doing and update us on what's going on okay miss mccray i have the sickle cell trait what can i do to improve my immune system okay sickle cell trait means you don't have sickle cell disease but you do have enough sickle cells so they can compromise or uh, one uh conscientiously uh, make sure that your children are checked because one out of four of your children can get the trait and pass it on uh the sickle cell trait uh, runs in my family. I do not have it, but it does run in the family. And so there are family members that are impacted by it. Uh, family members can marry. Uh, and that has happened. Somebody else with the trait. And that, that should mean they should have uh, basically no worse than a one out of five chance, uh, a 50% chance of having a baby with the trait and a 25% chance of having a baby with sickle cell disease. And, you know, but sometimes you, you get unlucky. And they will have uh, one of those issues. So you need, uh, you know, children will need counseling, genetic counseling on when they get ready to procreate. But boosting the immune system, the lipoimmune product is excellent for you. Uh, taking the vitamin D at 5,000 international units per day and the lipoimmune product will give you optimal, optimal immune function. So I recommend that you go to the website, lipodrops.com and get that information and look at those products. The vitamin D again is vitamin D3, the active vitamin D, at a, a dose that is therapeutic and will get your levels up between 60 and 90, the normal range being 30 to 90, which will be immune protective as well as uh, cancer preventive. Then uh, the, uh, the lipoimmune has a, a elderberry extract, which is a great natural antifungal, antiviral, antibiotic, and then uh, vitamin C, which helps with a variety of different things when you have an infectious disease challenge. And then the, um, we said the elevator extract, vitamin C, and um, the third component, I'm blocking on it. Okay. So, but the um, zinc, zinc is the third component. So you get zinc. Zinc is amazingly good at uh, boosting your immune system. It has its own natural anti-infective abilities. So those are products that Dr. Kai takes every day. I take the lipoimmune twice a day in the morning and in the evening when I brush my teeth. And that gives me great optimal function. I take my vitamin D uh, sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the evening, sometimes at lunch. It just kind of depends on what kind of mood I'm in and how long it's been between taking the two. You, They are perfectly compatible. You can take both of them at the same time and they will give you optimal immune response. Great question. You need to be on it or something like that. For the duration that will optimize your immune function and help prevent you from being susceptible to infectious diseases because as a sickle cell trait carrier that you are more susceptible uh, to disease states they uh, have put people on penicillin therapy on a daily basis uh why penicillin i don't know it's you know 40 percent of bacteria are now resistant to penicillin but there are people that are taking it on a daily basis when instead of treating an infection that you may or may not have boost your immune system so that you don't get infection. That would be the way that I'd recommend that we do this. And then you can take, uh, you know, penicillin as needed or some other antibiotic that will probably be more effective uh, than plain penicillin. Okay, great question. Are cold sores the same as herpes? Sherry Gamble, yes, they are. Cold sores are herpes. But guess what? Herpes is nothing but the chicken pox virus. So if you, and if you went to public school by the time you were age five, you had been exposed to the chickenpox virus. So if we did a test on you, your test would be positive uh, because it's a blood test and it evaluates uh, what you have. So there are two designations for the same disease state. If you get infected and you get a cold sore on your lips, 
that's called uh, HSV, a herpes simplex virus one. If you get it below the belt, that's called genital herpes, and that will break out usually on your genital organs or around the anus, somewhere in the perineal area. Uh, that is called a genital herpes. That is uh, HSV2. The thing is that with so many people indulging in 69 and in oral sex and that kind of stuff, that designation has really lost its scientific validity because you can have a type one type of herpes below the belt and vice versa. Uh, the thing is that one is just a chickenpox virus. It is not a curse, a life sentence, etc. There are very effective medications that you can treat with topically when you have a fever blister or orally to treat an acute fever blister or to prevent getting the fever blisters. And so you call that an outbreak and you can take daily chronic suppressive medications of a medication called Fambir or Valtrex or Acyclovir. Those are the three names of the medications that are available. You take them daily and you don't never have an outbreak. Uh, you only take them when you have an outbreak. The great thing about these types of infections that the longer you have them, the milder they become and the less frequent the outbreaks, unless you are somewhat otherwise immune compromised. But for regular people, normal functioning immune system, and this is what we always give advice about regular people, then you do nothing. And over time, it just gets milder, uh, we have found. So less of an issue, but something that, uh, again, you don't want to share this good news. So if you have a, a fever blister on your lips, no kissing, no kissing. It takes about uh, 10 to 14 days for it to run its course. So you can do absolutely nothing and it will be gone in four weeks. I mean, I'm sorry, in two weeks. <clears throat> or you can treat with uh, either topical or, or, or both. And it can be gone in as little as three days. So uh, if that is indeed a problem, then I would get a prescription from my uh, physician for the oral treatments. Uh, and people say, I'd rather put something on it. The oil treatments are actually much more effective, but it's not an either or. Uh, some of the uh, anti-herpes treatments are now available over the counter. You can get them at any drugstore. There are gels, various gels, creams, lotions that you put directly on the lesion. Just make sure that if you touch that lesion, you do wash your hands because on your lips, no problem. On your genitalia, a problem, but not a big problem. You touch it, get on your finger, touch your eyes, gets in your eyes, major problem now. So it can cause, you know, in a major infection and blindness. So very important that we uh, monitor that condition and disease state. Okay, great question, Sherry. Derek Kendrick, what's the best way to lose belly fat? I'm desperate and lazy. Derek, guess what? You don't have to do a single sit-up crunch, go to the gym. And once again, Dr. Kai is reiterating, you do not lose weight in the gym. You become fit in the gym. You lose weight in the kitchen. So the key thing is what you're eating, how you're eating, number of calories that you're taking in. Uh, you decrease your calorie count by 500 uh, uh, a day. Over seven days, it's 3,500 calories. That's what's required to lose one pound. You can lose four to five pounds per month just by doing that. Uh, cut out, uh, you know, sugary sodas and drinks and uh, sweet tea and all those things that are liquid calories because your body does not recognize liquid calories. And you don't get a sense of satiety from it. You don't get full from it. Uh, next, lipo drops. The lipo drops. Lose the muffin top with the lipo drops. The unique thing about lipodroxy is that it uniquely allows you to metabolize fat in areas that you cannot traditionally exercise it away from, like under your chin, across your back, the back fat and the bra strap area, ladies, the lumps under the arms, the belly in particular, the inner thighs, the outer thighs, all those areas where there are fat deposits, you cannot target weight loss. You can do a thousand crunches and have a very strong six pack underneath six inches of fat because you cannot target weight loss in that manner but the objective being that if you do something that alters your body's metabolism the first place it's going to go is where the fat is if the fat is on your belly that's where you will lose the fat that is the great thing about the lipo drops product you put the lipo drops under your tongue a full drop of full you hold it under your tongue for two minutes then swallow it the work is done by being absorbed under the tongue Swallowing it doesn't do anything to help. It doesn't have to get into your stomach to make you lose the belly fat. Uh, so, but that's how you take it. Two minutes under the tongue before each meal. And that changes your body's uh, metabolism of food, stops you from storing fat. And guess what? Once you stop storing fat, then your body starts utilizing fat that it has stored. It recognizes this phenomenon and says, hey, not only do I not need to store fat, I can let go of the fat that I have stored. 
and you literally just start to melt. Uh, the response is amazing and, uh, you know, something that you should track. Go to the website, lipodrops.com. All the listeners, if you got belly fat you want to lose, go to the website, lipodrops.com and get, uh, you know, lose the muffin top with lipo drops. Keisha Hill, good evening. How much probiotics should we take? Billions. Okay. The, the, the unit of measure for a probiotic is colony forming units or CFUs. Uh, there are products that have probiotics with colonies in the millions with an M. The thing is, and the problem is, you need to have colonies that are in the billions with a B. And ideally, you want more than one colony. Our lipobiotic product has three colonies, uh, each in the billions of, of uh, uh, units, uh, colony forming units, billions of colony forming units that are, it's very important that you do that. Some of the best selling probiotics that are over the counter now, uh, doing my research, I found they only have one colony of bacteria. So regardless of whether it's good bacteria or bad bacteria, you don't want one colony of bacteria to become predominant because that is just as bad as having a mixture of bad bacteria. So with our product, you've got three different types of bacteria, all in the billions of colony forming units. It's very easy to take one capsule in the morning, one capsule in the evening. Does not have to be stored in the refrigerator. Does not have to. It's not liquid. Doesn't have any smell. You open the bottle. It has no palliative sensation to it. You don't smell anything. You don't see anything. It's just a capsule. You take that and that is life changing. So go to the website, lipodrops.com, get the probiotics and change your life, Keisha. Rhonda Darrington Jones, what is good for lowering A1C? Well, the A1C is a 90-day picture of your average blood sugar. So a three-month look back on how, on what you've been eating, how you've been doing it, and what to do. A normal A1C is 6.5 or less. Normal without diabetes is, is 5.7 or less. So you want to be, ideally, you want to be between 4.5 and 5.7 in your A1C level. But if you go up to 6.4, that puts you in the category of what's called pre-diabetes, means you don't have diabetes. That's, let's make that clear. But it means you may be susceptible to it and can't convert uh, because you're very close to that line. So you lower your A1C by controlling your blood sugar. How do you control your blood sugar? One, uh, eating those foods that are appropriate for a diabetic diet. The American Diabetes Association or ADA diet recommends great things, uh, good foods that will give you enough carbs and energy to uh, allow you to get through the day. You have enough fuel in your tank, but not a lot of extra carbohydrates and sugars that will make your A1C go up. And then your medications for diabetes. Uh, if you have diabetes, uh, the first level, uh, of course, is metformin, the number one diabetes medication in the world which is used to treat everything from polycystic ovary syndrome to prediabetes as well. I would put my patients with prediabetes as they start to approach 6.5, which is the threshold for a diagnosis of diabetes on metformin. I just had a patient today, uh, literally today, uh, right before we started this broadcast, her hemoglobin A1C came down from 6.4 to 5.5. So she is now not even in pre-diabetic range. And she said, is that because of the metformin? Yes, it is. In addition to dietary changes that we made, but the metformin will lower that. If you are taking more than metformin, whatever your diabetes regimen is, make sure you're one, taking the medications, two, making sure that they're working for you. Uh, because just because you're taking it doesn't necessarily mean that it's working. That sometimes requires me to see my patients as often as every two weeks until we get the sugar controlled. After that, I see my diabetics at least every three months. And the worst thing we can do is get control because once we get control, they say, do I have to come back in three months? Well, yes, you do, because we want to maintain control. I have found with experience that the only thing that happens once I start to stretch out the office visits is that they lose control. And I'd much rather stay on top of the diabetes, have a, a, a very quick and substantive visit uh, every three months, say, yeah, you're doing great, keep doing what you're doing, or change this medication and see what we need to do to keep that diabetes under control. Because that is what a lowering of the A1C indicates, a control of the diabetes disease state. And if you're pre-diabetic, again, that means you're genetically probably predisposed to become diabetic. If you have a history of diabetes during pregnancy or gestational diabetes, uh, that means you're definitely pre-diabetic and, and more than likely going to have diabetes at some point in your life. So we need to stay on top of that, keeping the weight down and keeping the blood sugars low. Okay. Okay, Marvin Faison, first time. Thank you, Marvin. I appreciate you. Currently taking lisinopril and amlodipine, and it impacts my manhood at times. 
any other blood pressure pills you recommend that does not cause this? Uh, one, Myron, I hate to tell you, the Cinepril does not cause that, and Amlodipine does not cause that. If anything, Amlodipine, one of my favorite antihypertensive medications, usually helps with that phenomenon because Amlodipine is a vasodilator. So the mechanism of erection is one of blood flow. So let's say you have a pipe that's this big and you take amlodipine and the pipe that's this big now becomes a pipe that's this big. So you have improved opportunity for increased blood flow. So not only does it not cause erectile dysfunction, it usually causes increased blood flow, the mechanism of erection being increased blood flow to the penis. So you have longer and harder erections. Uh, nobody ever complains about that. And it's one of the reasons that I choose amlodipine and drugs like it first line in my treatment of hypertension. The Cinepril blocks a hormone that's secreted by your kidneys that makes your blood pressure go up under stress. If that hormone isn't present, the Cinepril literally doesn't do anything. Uh, if that hormone is present, it does not lower your blood pressure. It stops your blood pressure from going up. A very important and significant difference. So there are other reasons that are uh, that's affecting your manhood. It's not that treatment regimen. So Disassociate that mindset from uh, your blood pressure. Your blood pressure disease state itself can cause problems with erectile function. And so controlling your blood pressure, that's a decent regimen. There are better blood pressure regimens. I would consider changing the Cinepril, which is an ACE inhibitor, to a newer medication class of drugs called the angiotensin receptor blocker. Uh, there are uh, one Losartan, there's one called Omosartan. Uh, all of those are now generic and inexpensive, and you can get them easily to replace the Cinepril. And then, uh, uh, you know, have a, a complete evaluation to make sure nothing else is going on. There's no other reason uh, for that. But most of my men that are on blood pressure medication, they start having erectile dysfunction. They complain or they think it's the medications that they're doing. And Dr. Collier does not, would not, would never uh, give a, a, a particularly an African-American man a medication that would negatively impact his love life because I wouldn't take it either. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to do that. Uh, there are medications that that obviously will do that. Sometimes it's a necessary evil, but the vast majority of the time you can control a person's blood pressure without resorting to those types of medications. The problem is the books and the guidelines still say start off with these types of medications. And that's what doctors that don't understand or don't have empathy to that problem, they will give you those medications and they will negatively impact your ability to get an erection. So that's why culturally sensitive health care is so important, so important, so important. Somebody understands who you are, what you need and what you're going to tolerate and what you should tolerate. But I never, ever, ever give a patient a medication, particularly my male patients, that's going to have a negative impact on their sexual function because what's the point? Who wants to live a long life if you can't live a long life enjoying those things that we do to have a good life? You know, and that's, you know, eating good foods, uh, having a cocktail on occasion, uh, you know, and having great sex with somebody that we love. That is what we live for and that's what we want to do. So Marvin, I want you to contact me and uh, we're going to have a direct talk and see what we can do to get you straight. Cause, uh, you look like you're in relatively good physical condition. This can be helped and we can do that. But you go to the website and look for lipo T lipo T for male enhancement. Uh, if it's not available right now, as soon will be, uh, or contact me directly and we'll make sure that you can get that problem. Okay. All right. Final question. Havoc. What's the best remedy for psoriasis? Try various creams, but not very effective. Twan Tappen. Psoriasis, the curse, is an autoimmune disease state that causes dry, scaly, very pruritic skin. Uh, it can be anywhere in your body. It can be on the scalp. It can be on the face. Uh, it causes what's called plaquing. Those plaques usually have no pigmentation, so they show up as pink or white. Uh, on dark skin, light skin, white skin, the plaques are, are the same. They all look the same. They're pink, white, and scaly. So it gives you that look. Uh, the, the topical uh, treatments are steroid-based creams. There are some now that are not steroid-based that are very uh, effective as well. But they now recognize that psoriasis is basically a manifestation of an autoimmune process. And they are treating it with immunologics. Uh, injectable medications, pills as well that can treat this and shut down your body's response. It, it lowers your body's uh, uh, immune system response. So you can, it can, it can make you more susceptible to various types of infections. But uh, uh, again, that is something that is readily available now. You've seen, if you watch television at all, particularly some of them doing the football games, they run these commercials nonstop uh, for medications that treat everything from irritable bowel syndrome to, uh, um, to uh, psoriasis. 
So these are medications that they started off treating one disease state and they found out that a lot of these disease states are based on one inflammation, which Dr. Kai just told you over and over and over. And, uh, you know, autoimmune issues where your body is attacking itself. And so you calm that down. A lot of these things get better. But the psoriasis plaques, uh, this new product that I've seen advertised gives like 90 percent in a very short period of time of plaque reduction. Uh, the thing is that you have to stay on these medications. They don't you know, once you stop taking it, you go back to being the same way. So uh, very important that you stay on top of it. But there are treatment options. Google new treatments for psoriasis new uh, oral and injectable treatments for psoriasis and you will be really shocked and amazed at the type of information that's out there now uh the creams are first line is what any doctor would offer you uh you start off with a primary care then you go to a dermatologist they're going to offer you various types of creams because that's the one the old time solution two the simple and elegant solution and three the inexpensive solution and then go into some of these newer products which are, uh, are costly but do work okay that's going to close the show out today Thank you so much for tuning in. It has been absolutely amazing, incredible, phenomenal. We are so glad that you are here listening to the Your Health is Important broadcast. Remember, we come to you every second and fourth Wednesdays, 6.30 Eastern Standard Time, allowing you to let us know who you are and ask and get answered your health care questions. I am Dr. M.J. Kaya, your host, producer, and on our personality here for the Your Health is Important Facebook Live broadcast. Remember, tune in, tell your friends, go to the website, lipodrops.com and join Dr. Collier's Weight Loss Challenge 2023. We want you to tell us what you're losing, how you're losing it, and how effective you are having the types of success you're having with our products. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.